There's a story told of a 14th century duke, Reginald III, and he and his brother Edward, they'd gotten to a feud, and Edward had won this, uh, this battle, and Reginald was imprisoned. And it said that Edward had built this room for Reginald, and um, that he had let nice windows and the door, and that he would allow Reginald to leave any time he wanted to, but Reginald was a, a large man. He had eaten a lot, that especially under imprisonment. Edward continually fed him lots of good food and sweets, and, and Edward knew that uh, Reginald was a prisoner of his own appetite and that he wouldn't be able to fit out of the window or, or the door. And so that way when people ask Edward, you know, why are you so cruel to your brother? Uh, Edward could say, you know, my brother's not a prisoner. He's free to leave any time he wants. And it's actually said that after uh, Edward had died in battle, and that's when Reginald was released, and it's said they had to break the walls to get Reginald out. And when you think about that story, when you think about the, the history there, you kind of wonder, you know, what, what's the truth uh, behind it all? You know, was it, were the doors locked? Was he able to go free? There's a lot of questions there um, that we just don't have all the answers to. But that being said, yeah, you ask yourself, um, the word, when it comes to the word prison, what comes to mind? Does the word freedom have a connection? When you think about being imprisoned, freedom is one of the things that comes to our minds right away. In the pictures on movies where you think about this when you're in a, in a, in a cell and maybe you can see a little bit of light in the top corner, there's like maybe a little window or something you can only kind of get a little glimpse of daylight. And that's all you can think about is your freedom. Freedom is one of those words that's really difficult for us to, uh, to understand, depending on the context, depending on your perspective. Freedom can look different to different individuals. So to that person in prison, as all they can imagine is, you know, walking barefoot maybe through the grass, just being able to go out in nature and listen to the, the, the little uh, trickle of the stream or have this, the warm sun on their skin or the cool breeze or smell the flowers. All these things going through their minds. To them, maybe that's freedom. To others, you know, they might think of freedom in a different way. We, we've been watching in the news a lot going on with the royals. And, and you think about maybe royal families throughout history. Maybe some of the children of some kings and queens who there's a particular way they need to act. or There's a particular set of rules. Maybe they, they're not allowed out of the side of the walls of the castle or out of the kingdom. Maybe everywhere they go, they have to have some, some guards with them to, to protect them. And maybe... That's what they think about is, oh, what it would be like to be free, to be different, not to have all these rules and regulations and, 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 and restrictions. And the person in prison who maybe would hear the, the prince or the princess, you know, talk about their freedoms or lack of freedoms, they might say, you have no clue what freedom's about. And then there's others. There's maybe that person who they've done something really bad, something they're ashamed of and something they've had to live with for years. And... You know, just this heavy weight, something they're hiding. And, and they have to maybe look over their shoulder and, and worry every time the phone rings or that there's a knock on the door that this is going to be the police coming for them. Imagine that. To that person, freedom is getting that off their shoulders and to lightening, light, lightening their load that they have. And so freedom can look different to many different individuals. We talk about freedom, maybe you think about slaves. There's another scenario where freedom might take on a, a different, uh, different view. Uh, where you're working hard, you think of the Israelites, and they're working hard for someone else. Uh, Bianca told me last week of, uh, uh, of this uh, time when a, a joke where this um, a business owner came, and he, he came by to, to see how everyone was doing, and one of, he, he drove in with his Ferrari. One of the employees came out, and he said, Wow, sir, that's a beautiful car. And uh, he, the, the man said, he said, You know what? If, uh, if you work really hard, maybe next year I'll bring a different model. And when you, when you think about that, right, you think about slavery and you're like, wait a minute. Some of us feel like slaves because we're working so hard and you can never get ahead. And other people are maybe getting ahead and, and, and it doesn't feel right. And so again, you think of freedom and depending on the context, depending on your perspective, the word freedom is going to look different to many of us and, and it may be even different in different times different parts of the world. But here freedom comes up and, and we read about the law of freedom. We read about that in scripture and we read about um, the freedom that Christ gives in Galatians chapter 5. If you're not there, turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. The apostle Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. 
And unless we understand what kind of freedom that Paul's talking about there, unless we understand that, well, you know, what does that mean? Some Christians think, you know, well, I'm free. I live by Christ. I don't answer to anyone else. And, and they have this idea that, you know, um, that, that this freedom goes hand in hand with my rights and physical, what I do physically or, uh, around me and, and in the environment that I'm in. We, we're, you know, a lot of people today were, you know, we're kind of, we're really honed in at our, our rights and freedoms and making sure that we get all of that. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying maybe that's a misunderstanding of the freedom that Paul's talking about here. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and don't, subject, don't be subjected again to the yoke of slavery. So he's really talking here, he's talking about the, to these converts, you know, these, these Gentile converts, these new Christians who are coming into Christianity, they're coming into a new covenant. The new covenant in Jesus' blood, which is different from the first covenant. And so, you know, becoming a Christian after you've lived your life as a Jew is one is one thing. Becoming a Christian having, you know, no idea of, of the Jewish law and, you know, a totally different uh, perspective is another. And so Christ, these, um, uh, these individuals, you know, they're coming to Christianity and Paul is saying, listen, there's others there that are putting this pressure on for them to, to follow the law. That you can be a Christian, you can still follow the law. But Paul says, you know, if you let yourself get circumcised, then if you think it's by the old law that you are saved, then you have to follow the whole law. And that's what he says. Take a look here. Again, I testify, verse 3, to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. You see, the old covenant, the, the, the law that the Jews were under, the law wasn't able to save them. The law was perfect, but they couldn't follow it. They kept falling. They tried their best to follow the law, but to follow the law of God is, you know, to be perfect, to not to sin. You're following, you know, the way that God shows you. But people weren't able to do that. That's the whole story of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer says, for the first covenant had been faultless. This is in Hebrews chapter 8, 7 to 13. Um, sorry, for if the first covenant had been faultless, there was a fault that was with the people. He said, there would have been no occasion for a second, but finding fault with his people... He says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. And then he goes on, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellows, and each person will not teach his fellow citizen, and each his brother or sister saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them, for I will forgive their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. By saying a new covenant, uh, he has declared the first obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. And so we see that we live under a new covenant. A new covenant that brings freedom. Some people would look at the Jewish system and they would say, you were slaves in Egypt, God had set you free and he brought you out into the desert and he gave you the law. And when, they, when you look at Judaism, it looks like, wow, you aren't free at all. You're just, you've exchanged one, you know, one system of slavery for another. That's what some people would say. You know, you've got to follow your rules and regulations, your ceremonies, your sacrificial system. There's so many things that you have to do to get your physical freedom. And some of you say you're, you're, you know, you're, you're not free by following all those rules. Some people would look at Christianity and maybe say the same thing. Look at you Christians and the way you live and, and you know, you're, you're always going to church, you're always reading your Bible, there's all these, that doesn't look like freedom. And to people who say that, I think they may not really understand the freedom that God is trying to talk about. You see, none of us are truly free. I want you to think about that for a minute. We like to think we're free, but we're not truly free. We don't live on little islands to ourselves. And, and even if you did live on an island to yourself, one day your garbage would float up onto someone else's island and you would infringe on their beautiful uh, shores at some point when that happens. You see, we think we're free, but you still have to, when you come to an intersection, you have to stop when the light says stop, right? You can't just decide, I'm just going to drive through this set of lights anytime you want. 
There's a set of rules that are in place because we as people live in community. We live with others. You can't just, if you, if you live in a condo and you've bought yourself a condominium, you can't just start knocking out foundational walls and, and, and doing things, you know, that, that still affects your neighbors. The things that we do, even if you have your own detached home, the things that you do it, to your home and in your yard, it affects neighbors. And that's why some, in some places there are specific bylaws that come out because of the, uh, uh, um, the abuse that some people have taken with their uh, understanding of freedom. Even those who maybe think they have total freedom, the, the most elite, the, the, the wealthiest in the world, they still have taxes to pay and laws to, to live by. There's still certain things they cannot do in society, places they can't go, and things they, they, that will be consequences if they say. We're, we're seeing that right now with, with social media and things that, that some very powerful people have said and, 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 and how it's taken away their freedoms. And so when you think about freedom, we're not just under, you know, this physical freedom that, that we think about with, uh, within the context of our society. But there's even, there's even physical limitations when it comes to what we can do. You can't just say, I'm, I'm going to go out and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a, a flight. You know, we live by the law of, laws of nature, the, the laws of gravity, right? You can't do that. As a matter of fact, I'll never forget this. It was a pretty sad situation. Um, there was a... Uh, an individual who ran into a lot of money and they decided to go out by helicopter. I remember reading about this years ago. And they decided they were going to fly their helicopter without a license or any training. They, they, they thought they knew enough about it. And they got off the ground, they got to a certain height, and the he helicopter came down and burst into flames and they died. And you think, well, that's a sad story. But they're limited. You're not just free to go out by the helicopter and go and fly the helicopter without without realizing that you, the, the law of gravity is going to make sure that you, you, know, you have to do some research before you do that. Maybe get your license. There's, there's a reason why these things are in place. And there's, just like the law of gravity is something that we are limited by, and you can't see it, you know, we are limited by the law of sin and death. And that's something you can't see either. It's one of those things that says, Christian, we try and teach this to people around us. Just like trying to teach our kids about gravity. Gravity is something, you know, you can hold, hold the pen and drop your pen and, and your kids can see it. And you can try and explain it to them. We're trying to explain to the world the law of sin and death. Because that's a law that we are all under. And just because we can't measure it the same, just because you can't see it, this is what Jesus came to warn us about. This is what Jesus came to free us from. The law of sin and death. And what that means is that God is good, God is perfect. And as a perfect God, we had this relationship with Him where we were created in His image. We were perfect until sin entered the world, until we sinned. God told us how we need to live, and God sets out now how we need to live in this world. But unless we can follow it perfectly, then, then we miss the mark and we sin. And as a result of sin comes death. Physical death, but more important, spiritual death. Separation from God. And in Romans 8, we're, 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 Paul tells us that we're, we're under the law of sin and death. And so, this is the backdrop to what Paul is talking about. You see, the law, the Old Testament law, if they could have followed it perfect, would have gotten them out of the, the sin and death, but they couldn't. God continually bailed out His people, continually highlighted just how sinful they were until finally God goes to the ultimate extreme and sends His Son into this world to die, to give true freedom, to send the Spirit out, the Spirit of freedom into this world that we can truly be free from that weight, that baggage of, of sin on our shoulders. And what that means is that while we're not under the old law, we don't have to go through all those rules and regulations and sacrificial system, we still have a way that we do live because we have been called higher. Because we are no longer under that law, we have a, way, a, a new way of showing others how to live. And so Paul would say, For you are called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. And in verse 14 of Galatians 5, For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. 
And so we live under the law of Christ, the law that brings freedom. I wonder, it's kind of like this. I wonder if this maybe is a good example. Imagine you did something terrible and you were, you were convicted and you found yourself in prison. And you were thinking about being able to return to normal life, but it just wasn't possible. The, 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 amount, the amount of money that, that that would take to get you out was just too high. But your parents decided they would sell everything they had. They would, they would sell everything they had and continue to work, to continue to pay so that you could be free. They lived in poverty so that you could be free. And so when, when the time for bail was finally at, at hand, there was enough money there so that you could be free. But you look back and you recognize that your parents lived in poverty maybe for 10 years saving up this amount of money so that you could be free early and you wouldn't have to continue to serve a longer sentence. What would you do if you got out of prison under those circumstances? Would you return to your old way of life? Would you use your freedom to go and to continue to do things that break the law and that could put you back right back in prison? I hope not. Most of us would say, no, you'd look at your parents and you'd say, you lived in poverty for 10 years for me? I need to make it up to you. What can I do? You see, you did nothing to earn that gift. They decided to, to do that for you. But you are indebted because you recognize the, the, the depth of their love for you. And you understand love now in a different way. And that's what God did when he sent his son on the cross for us. He went to the, the height of his power to give of himself a sacrifice, blood. When you think of the, the body and the blood of Christ, innocent sacrifice so that we could be free. And so Paul says, you know, we were called to be free. And he goes on to say, do not use your freedom for the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, now 16 to 26, I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then down in verse 24, after the fruits of the Spirit, he says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And then go right back um, to um, Galatians 5, 13 to 14. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use your freedom. Freedom from the law of sin and death. You are, now, you are now free from sin and death. You have life. And so now live this so that you can show God, spread the message to others. Live it by giving up your worldly freedoms so that you can show God how much you appreciate this gift and how important and special that God is to us because we're that important to Him. And so we give up some of our physical freedoms because we recognize that what we have with the freedom from the law of sin and death is much greater than the freedoms that we might enjoy here for a short time on this earth. And so Peter says, Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves, 1 Peter 2.16. So we use our freedom to be slaves for God. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And finally, as we remember, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, really chapters 8 through 10, when Paul's talking about you know, what he's doing and some people misunderstanding that maybe the, the food he's eating has been sacrificed to other gods and that's going to cause them to sin. And Paul's like, I better not do that so I, I don't offend them. And you know what Paul's attitude is at the very end of this whole argument? 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 8 through 10. Here's what it comes down to. Verse 30 says, if I partake with thanksgiving, why am I criticized because of something for which I give thanks? You know, if he knows it's okay to eat this meat, it's, there's no such thing as other gods, but other people are saying, hey, you shouldn't eat that. That's, they're, and they're offended. They're actually going to be confused in their own spiritual walk. Then Paul says, you know, if, you know, why am I criticized because of something for which I give thanks? He's not saying you shouldn't be criticized. He's telling us why it's okay 
for him. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. He was willing to change his actions to avoid those criticisms, even though he could have just said whatever. Uh, just as I try to please everyone in everything so that they might be saved. He's not seeking his own benefit. He said in everything, I'm not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many so they may be saved. And then verse cha- um, uh, and then uh, chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's the heels of that imitate me. Paul was willing to give up his physical rights and freedoms because he recognized that the most important and the only true freedom that we can have is the freedom from the law of sin and death. And that's the message we take to this world. And we do that in serving others and giving up some of our own physical rights and freedoms. Sometimes we have to do that. There is a, I want to end with this story. There was a, uh, a preacher who, um, this was told of uh, um, uh, a preacher, Tom Erickson. Uh, so this was told by Pastor Don Baker. He told the story of Tom Erickson. Erickson. So um, Tom Erickson, he lived next, or not, he, had a, he lived in the same city as this library who had, a, a, they had tried this new, um, this is before internet. They had tried this, this new system for kids. Kids could go and you could dial this number and there would be a story there so that you could, uh, um, you could dial in a number and hear a story. Sorry, you didn't go to the library. You just dialed the library. And someone from the library would read a story to your kids. The problem is that Tom's, Tom Erica, Erickson's phone number was like one digit off. And we've had, I've known that some of you, you might, you know, you, you remember what it was like to get the wrong number, especially if you, had a number that was very close to a very, you know, maybe a, a famous fast food place or something in town. You get constantly calls from wrong numbers, sorry. And so this guy was constantly getting these wrong numbers from these kids calling into the library for a story. So instead of getting mad at, and he was a preacher and he thought, you know, instead of getting mad every time he's got to get up and answer the phone, not again. And he, he had a different attitude, an attitude of serving. So he went out and he bought a little storybook. And every time that that wrong number called, and it was a little child looking for a story. He began to read them the story. You see, we find ways. We have true freedom. And one day, we'll better understand what that looks like. And in the meantime, may we find ways as slaves of God to serve Him by being willing to use our time, our energy, our freedoms and rights here on this earth in order to glorify God so that others might understand what true freedom means in Christ Jesus.